What do you think of when I say the word scientist? Perhaps the first image that comes to mind is a person in a white lab coat, hunched over a chemical experiment, isolated far away from civilization. You might even be thinking of a movie or book that comes to mind. And I don't blame you. Our culture has made mathematicians, scientists, and physicians seem so distant that we sometimes forget that the people who are going to be taking up those jobs come right from the schools like the one I'm speaking at right now. Well, if that's the case, you might be thinking that we're doing a pretty good job, with scientists making breakthrough discoveries at earlier ages than ever before. Heck, we're even seeing high school students entering professional STEM fields based purely off their expertise. So what's wrong? When a group of 2,279 PhD students across 26 countries were surveyed, over 40% of those in math and science-related fields conveyed the fact that they suffer from anxiety or depression, when only 6% of the entire survey group yielded a rate of depression. Just think about that. 40% in math and science compared to only a fraction of the entire survey. When we look at smaller local samples, we see the same trend. 790 UC Berkeley students were surveyed in postgraduate and professional schools, and over half of those in engineering programs related the fact that they had anxiety. Their main reason? They felt alone, that they could not turn to a faculty member during times of stress. Perhaps the scientist's image which I offered at the beginning is missing one key component, mental health. Our STEM students of today are mentally unhealthy because our curricula are not preparing them for the future. When I started my junior year of math, I thought that it was gonna be just like the two previous years of my high school experience, learning new formulas, solving equations, doing all that stuff we identify with math, the solitary grind that every student needs to get through in order to be prepared for college work. However, my teacher approached the year in a way that I would have never expected. We took personality tests and use those results to create graphs which we showcase to the class. We brainstormed soft skills that we continue to work on as the year progressed. And our teacher introduced us with a new challenge every day for 30 days, aptly named the 30 day challenge, whether that meant posting a funny picture to the class page or eating dinner one day during the weekday with our families. I even got to try completely new activities that I would have never done before, like high-fiving as many people as I could in the hallways or thanking the staff who work at my school. At first, I was a little surprised. How are we supposed to get through the entire curriculum if we spent so much time on these fun activities? My peers and I thought that it would pass as the year went on, but without realizing it, our teacher had structured the entire year based on a reflexive education model. We were given the space and time to reflect on our learning, instead of always completing more and more and more prompts to the point that we got sick of math. For the first time in my life, I was excited for the challenge that I would tackle in the math classroom. How did she do this? Completing those projects was only one part of the puzzle. We had to forge bonds with one another and with our teacher. This might sound like a really broad and general idea, but in reality, it's much more simple than it seems. After all, when STEM employers are looking for the students who are going to be taking up their next jobs, do you think that they're looking for those who can solve the most amount of problems in the shortest amount of time? School and life in general doesn't work like that. They want collaborative thinkers who can work together, not isolated scientists. For those of you who've watched the movie Apollo 13, this might not seem so foreign to you. A group of astronauts on their journey to outer space to the moon are suddenly confronted with an exploding oxygen tank. The group of scientists here on Earth are only able to save them when they pitch all of their individual ideas in a collaborative effort. Collaboration is what saves the group that was pushing the boundaries of what we knew about space. Scientists in the real world answer questions like, how can we construct a bridge that will allow the most amount of cars to travel on it? They don't answer questions like, how can we use the quadratic equation to find the two x-intercepts of this graph? Of course, we need to be able to answer the latter before moving on to the former, but that can't be our whole education. For my peers and I, that meant radically changing the way that we approached math and project-based learning. We wrote our own tests, bringing together the knowledge that we learned in a unit to solve. We presented how to solve certain questions based on our own ways of tackling them. And, most importantly, our teacher introduced us to outlets to remind us that we're humans, not quadratic equation-solving machines. 
With this mentality, students can remain mentally balanced even as the curriculum escalates in difficulty. Group work and mental wellness are extremely correlated with one another. If students had each other and their professors during tough academic times, then perhaps we wouldn't be seeing depression rates like the 50% UC Berkeley one showed us. 80% of all employees work in group settings. The human condition is oriented to working with others. Promoting collaborative learning in a math classroom, which is typically viewed as a solitary effort, will allow students to become more connected to the why behind certain concepts and allow their creativity to emerge. So what does this mean? Students, we need to be mindful that the classes we take are preparing us for the future. If you're a high school student making your decisions for college level classes, then make your choices based off the ones that will keep you most mentally balanced, whether they offer group work opportunities or partnership or mentorship opportunity with a teacher. The problems of the 21st century require educational methods designed for 21st century students. Not only will you feel relieved and engaged in the short term, but you'll also be making the most financially and socially advantageous decision. CEOs nowadays are screaming for project-based problem-solving learning, and you could be the student that takes that job in STEM. We also need to remember that our learning is a partnership with our teachers, and that we need to be willing to provide feedback based on ways that they can improve their class instruction. STEM teachers also need to be challenged to reshape the way they approach education and their interactions with students. Assignments and exams need to be constructed in ways that assesses a student's knowledge all the while allowing their creativity to emerge. While some tests could be the classic pen and paper, others could involve constructing visuals, orally explaining how to solve a certain problem, or using video or other media to tackle a question. STEM teachers also need to challenge their students to turn to other resources during tough academic times. For my teacher, that meant providing us with a 30-day challenge, but for other teachers that could mean anything, anything, as long as it allows students to tackle other questions that go beyond the ones that they would see in their STEM classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. Mathematicians and scientists are two extremely important professions in our society. Whether they're engineering a vaccine for a newly discovered illness, like the coronavirus that we're all too familiar with, developing the next technologies that are going to be in all of our houses, or developing a new transportation system, we can't leave them to be the scientists that are hunched over a chemical experiment and isolated far away from civilization. If we let the next generation of STEM graduates, who will go on to pursue these professions, live in a status of poor mental health, then their work will not be as fruitful because they'll not be enjoying what they're doing and consequently, all society will suffer. We need to start with our STEM curricula, whether that means introducing quantitative and qualitative assessments, or allowing students to get to know their peers and their teachers at the beginning of the year. Hopefully, when we ask the next generation of students what a scientist looks like, they'll tell us that it is a collaborative group worker surrounded by other thinkers solving the problems that our world will be facing. Thank you.